human memory is fragile. How we remember and share those memories is ever-changing. As we view images or listen to sounds, we give them meaning and purpose based on our own lives and belief structure. This evolves from generation to generation. The man with the film can is Michael Havis, a little known filmmaker who made two important documentaries in the 1970s. The first, a student film about the Battle of Crete titled Once Upon an Island. The second was named Sons of Tumatoenga and followed survivors of the 28th Māori Battalion on a pilgrimage cruise around the battlefields and cemeteries of World War II to remember those that never made it home. These films have been forgotten by time and their memory has faded. This is a journey to rediscover them. So it's 42 years, I just, I'm just hoping it's one or the other, either Sons or Once Upon an Island. Okay, let's have a look. So I'll turn the light on. I'll just wind in a bit so you can have a look. And here we are. It's what lost some color. Is that a chemical process or? Mm -hmm. uh, it's just basically age. Tell you what, why don't you come over here and start looking for yourself? Okay. There you go, I'll control it from here. Yeah, that's Once Upon an Island. My name is Julian Arahanga. I'm a filmmaker who's interested in understanding how and why Michael made these films. I've come to Prague in the Czech Republic, where this story begins. I was born in Prague in Czechoslovakia in 1947. Um, my father was a Slovak officer in the Czech arm of the RAF. He met my mother in London during the Blitz. They married, she's Czech. When the communists took over Czechoslovakia in 1948, he had to flee the country, and um, we ended up in New Zealand. I always wanted to be a writer, and I always wanted to make films. There was no film school in New Zealand, and um, eventually I ended up being accepted by the Prague Film Academy. So I moved from capitalism to communism. The moment I started studying film in Prague, it just, uh, there was just one thing to do. And we, we lived 24 hours a day, seven days a week, just thinking film. Julian, this is Cafe Slavia. Uh, it was built 20 years after the Treaty of Waitangi in 1860, 61. The rest of the building is my film academy. This is where we um, spent six years going to learn how to make documentary films. And every time our lecture stopped and we had a few minutes to spare, we'd come down here and uh, we'd dream of all the wonderful films that we were gonna make. In 1973, when I went with my girlfriend Phyllis to Crete, We didn't know how fantastic this place was. We were in love and we were looking for a nice romantic place. You just didn't know what was going to be over the hill. We, we walked through those cedar trees and suddenly this landscape, this lunar landscape opened up. I went fishing, I brought in the catch and she cooked it and occasionally we'd go into the village to buy some vegetables and tomatoes. We knew that there was this one village where there'd been a 
colossal massacre, like 180 people killed. Uh, we stopped in that village out of curiosity. We pulled up uh, beside this Cafenion, and the moment we sat down at the table, there was a complete hush. The men just stopped what they were doing. A policeman came over to our table and he said, where are you from? And I said, well, I'm from New Zealandia. The moment I said New Zealandia, he just spun on his heel. And there was a big uproar and cheers and, and they were extremely welcoming. We didn't have to pay for anything. The drinks were on the house. Eventually, somebody explained to me that this was because of the tremendous sacrifice that had been paid by the New Zealanders and the Maoris. I suddenly found myself in a strange position where people were offering us um, food for free. I came to Crete and I had no idea of what had happened on Crete. It took the Cretans to remind me of this sacrifice. And I felt so humbled by that that I decided to make Once Upon an Island. During the Second World War, the German war machine used Prague as a central hub for propaganda filmmaking. Michael gained access to this footage of elite German paratroopers who were to attack Crete from the air. He also did a series of original interviews with the New Zealanders whose job it was to defend the island. When we arrived at Crete, in my small pack, for instance, I was left only with my shaving gear, a pair of dry socks, a photograph of my wife and children, and a towel, and that was it. We had ab absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing, except the rifle and bayonet and a few rounds of ammunition. Every account of those paratroopers coming in, those planes coming in, the sound of that, you know, airborne army heading towards them, now, you can you imagine, you know, I've got a rifle and look what's coming, you know, the sky was black. Among the New Zealand soldiers waiting on the ground was Ned Nathan, an officer in the 2-8 Battalion and a man who Michael would befriend during the making of Once Upon an Island. What I remember most vividly was the soldiers jumping from the plane, the German soldiers jumping from the plane and who at that instant were virtually defenceless and we were shocked for the moment that we had to shoot these defenseless men falling to the ground. Mind you, this was only for the moment. When we realized that this was war, and total war, we then began firing, and it was terrible. It was wholesale slaughter. Despite taking heavy casualties, the constant wave of German paratroopers soon gained a foothold on the western edge of the island. They captured the highest feature overlooking the Malemi airfield, and in doing so, could now control the airfield itself. I'm traveling with Michael to Crete to visit the places where he was first inspired to tell these stories. We're meeting Nikos, a friend of Michael's and staunch Cretan cultural advocate. They haven't seen each other for 30 years. He's a master of traditional dance, language and music. Nikos is going to be our guide and our translator while we're here on Crete. He's taking us to our first stop. We're heading to the Commonwealth Grave Cemetery in Suda Bay, where Michael first visited in 1972. This is Suda Bay, um, northern coast of Crete, and it's, it, it's in a bay which probably provides one of the finest anchorages in the whole of the Mediterranean, which is one of the reasons why it was a strategic point during World War II. I didn't know about the Battle of Crete, and suddenly to see New Zealand names, Maori names on these white stones um, in this setting, it, 
it was one of the little triggers which, which started me thinking that it was time to make a story about this.